found out what type of advertising I would have to do, what the customer base would look like. And I built a business plan and I kept bringing it back to my grandfather and showing it to him, my pro forma on how I would make money with this. And uh, he came back and would challenge me and say, well, you need to tweak this, you need to watch that. You need to find uh, a way to be a little bit more profitable and make your money back. Finally, I came up with the right model, bought $10,000 worth of equipment, which I was very lucky to have my grandfather uh, fund me at the time. And I sat down and wrote a good business plan, I thought, and bought all this equipment, had an ISDN line installed at my house, and I was ready to start selling dial-up service. And what I found is I had none of the right equipment. I had no idea what I was doing, and I didn't know the first thing about starting a dial-up internet service provider. I thought I did, but I, I, I didn't learn enough. So I had all this, this debt now. I owed my grandfather all this money, and I was determined to pay him back. $10,000 is a lot of money, especially in high school. And uh, so I was determined to pay him back. And I said, I've got all these computers now. What can I do with it? And at that time, I actually started to meet my, uh, my business partner still today uh, through a mutual friend. And he was doing website development. And I said, well, I've got a computer. I've got a website, website design software. I can build websites. It doesn't look too hard. And I, I quickly found out I also can't build websites. I'm not very good at it. I could put some together. That, that didn't look great. But I could do that as well. But uh, through our, our partnership, we, we began to operate a website development company. And I, I was determined to find a way to make use of that equipment. So when Don was introducing me, saying uh, Core 3 was really born out of necessity, it really truly was. I, I had to find a way to use this equipment. And so I did. Well, as we uh, built up what was then SiteServe 2000, that, that became our website development company through high school, and continue to build it up through college, we saw other opportunities out there uh, for other businesses. And SiteServe 2000, uh, which you guys can see clearly is not the name anymore because the year 2000 came and went pretty quickly. Uh, it was innovative at the time to have the word 2000 in your name. Um, SiteServe 2000 began to branch off into other areas. NetX doing home networking and 21 NetStreet, we began doing website hosting and Direct One Data did office networking and we had a during the dot-com boom, we had a startup called TroyMenu.com, which was uh, showing restaurants all in the city of Troy. You could order online. It was pretty neat at the time. Um, but we, we began to branch out, and we created separate companies under the advice of our lawyers telling us, you know, best way to do it. Uh, we, we quickly realized that filing that many tax returns was uh, a, a big headache, and, and so we said, all right, the year 2000 is gone. Let's consolidate everything under one name. And uh, long and short of it, that's where Core 3 was born. We brought everything together under one roof. I went to Michigan State University. My business partner went to Michigan. Somehow we survived going to rival schools. And uh, when we emerged, the true Core 3 was born into what it is today. We, we both graduated. We took our time, took five years. And we got our first office in Birmingham. And it's actually the office building we're in today. We continue to expand and grow in that office space. But Core 3 over time has really uh, evolved into what we were offering. The original design of, of Core 3 was website development, web hosting, and computer repair. We still focus a lot on those areas. Uh, actually, just yesterday, we uh, did a transaction and sold our web hosting division, uh, which was a relief in some senses. It's uh, a big liability to have web hosting. but. Um, that has allowed us to focus on other areas, including online marketing uh, being one of them. So there's still three focus areas and still the roots of our name. But Core 3, when we graduated from college and, and got the office in Birmingham, uh, we're very lucky to have a business that already had a customer base and we're already running with. And it allowed us to uh, really sit down and finally focus on, on the business in itself and really grow and expand Curtis uh, was one of our, our first employees, and he came in uh, one day with a suit and tie on and resume in hand and, and applied. And from there, we've really grown. We're presently at uh, 15 employees. Is that right? 14, 15? Okay, 14. We'll go with that. 14 employees, and uh, we're on pace to do probably $1.5 million this year in revenue, which I'm very happy with. From when we started, you know, five years ago, we were doing $250,000 revenue. So. We are continuing to grow and expand, and actually uh, one of the things that Don mentioned, we're uh, venturing into a new business, a software as a service application called QuoteGen, 
And what it is is it's an online quoting software that allows companies like ours, website development companies or service companies, really any business, it could be a builder, to easily create, deliver, and have proposals signed online without ever having to open Microsoft Word, drag and drop templates, drag and drop pieces. And, and really the evolution of the product is going to continue to grow and, and evolve as the tablet market expands here in 2011. I think 20 new tablets were announced at CES a week ago. So uh, we're really excited about Quotion and where we're going with that too. Did I miss anything about Quotion, Curtis? Okay. So real quickly, who is uh, Core 3? Um, as I touched base on earlier, uh, founded in 1997, provide IT and web solutions. Uh, really our focus now is design development, online marketing and IT and help desk support. So when I say we've evolved the business model over the year, over the years, when we first got into our office, we were doing residential uh, computer repair, a lot of break fix. A majority of our IT business now comes from residual monthly maintenance contracts that allow us to focus on customers for help desk support needs, server maintenance. We don't do a lot of the break fix type work anymore. We don't focus on residential customers. We focus on business customers from 10 to 50 users in that range, maintaining their environments, making sure that they're running optimally and allowing us to be their outsourced IT solution. On the website development end of things, we've grown and evolved to uh, a, a $2,000 uh, website. was used to be very exciting for us uh, to, to land a contract like that. Our, our low end now is about $4,000. But what that means is we've stepped up our talent. We've stepped up what we're able to provide an offer to the client. It's not just Ryan and I developing websites anymore. It's a team of website developers, programmers, project managers, delivering uh, a top of the line solution to our customers. Um, speaking of our customers, I'll just quickly show off two of them. One of them is Jive Records, Jive Label Group. Uh, they actually came to us, which was a little bit of a surprise. We said, Jive Label Group, one of the, the oldest and uh, most prominent record labels in, in the country, uh, internationally known, has come to Core 3 Solutions in Birmingham, Michigan. And uh, they found us through a, another website we were developing and working on. And we met with them in New York City. And shortly after that, landed the deal. We're very excited about that. Uh, disappointed I never got to meet Britney Spears, but uh, maybe someday. Uh, Detroit Wheel and Tire is another great case study of ours. We're very proud because obviously Detroit's in there. Very proud about our city and continue to grow and evolve here. This company came to us and they were doing, uh, I think they're spending about twenty dollars to $30,000 a month on eBay fees, doing a lot of their transactions on eBay. We we're able to take that, build them an e-commerce solution, and now they're processing several million, do million dollars in transactions on uh, their website, no longer paying all those fees out to eBay. So we're very proud of that website as well. Some of my other experience actually comes from uh, another, what I used to refer to as my nightlife. I ran uh, two retail stores for a while, retail and popcorn stores called Dale and Thomas Popcorn. Some of you may be familiar with the brand. They're uh, very well known nationally. And five, four or five years ago, I signed up as the exclusive franchisee in the state of Michigan for Dale and Thomas Popcorn. Core 3 was growing, but I'd go home at night and I was just I was kind of bored. I didn't have kids yet. My wife wasn't my wife, she's still my girlfriend. So I said, you know, I need something to keep me busy, keep me entertained. And uh, I thought I'd go out, start up these popcorn stores and hire a manager and they'd run themselves. I'd check in from time to time, sample the popcorn, make sure it was okay. And I was very ambitious about growing this, this brand in Michigan. Um, you know, and a lot of that was, was the case, but you, you need to really devote a lot of time and, and energy to, to these things, which I was able to do, but um, it's oftentimes a lot different in the world of being a franchisee. And so I, I went from having my own business, be able to control the brand and the image and, and my online advertising, to now also, you know, to being a franchisee in a system where I really didn't have much of a say in what was going on with, with this company. So I was intrigued by it and I, and I got into it and, and had a lot of great experience. I actually just recently had to close down my stores as my franchise agreement ended. Um, but it was uh, a great experience from looking at a totally different side of the coin. Uh, it's really interesting to, to, in the retail world to see how 
you can, uh, for lack of a better term, manipulate the consumer to buy what you want them to buy and, and looking at different things like that. So um, I have some experience in, in the franchise and um, big box world as well. I had a store in uh, downtown Royal Oak and also in uh, 12 Oaks Mall. So that was fun. But to talk about uh, being an entrepreneur a little bit, an entrepreneur, as I've always had it defined, is anyone who takes a risk and starts their own venture. And whether it be a franchise business or it be a business you start on your own, it's always a risk. They say, what, 90% of small businesses fail in the first year. And that's absolutely, probably true. Um, I can't say absolutely, but I've had quite a few businesses that have failed myself. Uh, luckily, I've had Core 3 that's always been there and has always been successful, but uh, it takes a lot of work. It, it takes a lot of dedication. You really have to pour your heart into it. And in the beginning, it's going to take a lot of your time. Um, it doesn't mean that it can't be done. It doesn't mean that anything's not possible. I'm always the first person to say that anybody can do anything they want to do. It's all about how much you want to put into it. If somebody tells me they want to start a business, then they're going to go out and they're going to try it and they're going to see if they can get some customers. That person's more likely to fail than somebody who really wants to start a business and is very passionate about it and very excited about what they're going to do. Um, I created my five things I think every entrepreneur should know, and there's certainly a lot of lists out there like this. The eagle's meant to signify soaring and reaching new heights. Um, and, and there's certainly more than this, but with time constraints, sorry, there's a couple things I really wanted to hit on that I thought anybody getting into business really should know. Lessons that I wish I had, I had learned uh, years ago when I started. The first is always know your target market. Know what business you're getting into, where you're going with it. So when I started my internet service provider back then, I was researching um, who the typical dial-up customer is, how many are in a radius of an area, what uh, the typical monthly spend is. Now, in, in, in different businesses can look at different ways. If you're going to get into the popcorn business, who eats popcorn? How much do they, they average a year on popcorn? Um, if you're opening a retail store, what's the best place to open a retail store? What are the demographics around that retail store? You're looking for, or you have a high-end product, then you find a six-figure median income. Do you have a product where you want some dedication and, and uh, neighborhood associations behind you, you, you look at a, a place uh, you can get involved and really touch the hearts of your neighbors. Slow's Barbecue is a great example of that and what Phil Cooley's done with that. So uh, really get to know your target market and what you're getting into. Next is research, research, research. And this kind of comes off the tails of knowing your target market. Really research the business that you're getting into. Um, if you are know every dollar you're going to be spending on your business, add 25% to it. You're, you're never going to be right on what you're predicting to do as far what your expenses are going to be. And it's just a natural, natural thing. You may have forgotten something. Prices could have gone up, uh, any number of things. But research, research, research on, on every different level with the business that you're getting into, especially if you're going to buy into a franchise. There's a, there's a lot that you can learn about the history of that franchise, um, competitors in the marketplace, and, and that all falls into that. The, uh, what I call sometimes the Paul Chambers syndrome, you're one person, you cannot do it all. You can't do everything. You, you can't be in a million places at once. And I uh, oftentimes, I, I still sometimes, this happens, it happens to the best of us where you feel like you can take care of everything and it's only going to take you 10 minutes to do this one task, but you forget about the time to refocus. You forget about the time that you're, you're off on what it's going to take you to actually do something. So uh, you cannot do it all. And if you can admit that and understand that and, and know that you, as you grow your business and as you continue to grow, or can release some of those responsibilities to other people to help you, you're going to be much better off. If you understand that from the very beginning, then you're going to be more successful in the end. There's a, a quote that was told to me a lot growing up, and I've heard it come from, uh, I heard that George Steinbrenner was the originator of it, and my stepdad was also claims to be the originator of this, but um, surround yourself with people smarter than you. And I'm going to go with George Steinbrenner being the originator of this. But, um, <clears throat> and, and one thing that I've learned from that is it, it's definitely 
worth it to surround yourself with people who are smarter than you. But you have to also understand that everybody's intelligence ranks on different levels and in different areas. Um, so there's absolutely no way I could ever do any mechanical engineering. I am, I am not that person. I also can't play an instrument. I can't play guitar for the life of me, and I'll never be able to. But I know there are people out there who can do any of those tasks. Now what I'm great at is uh, uh, networking. I can get out and, and sell this, this company any day of the week. I can tell anybody why they should work with Core 3. And that's the position I put myself in at Core 3. Curtis is great with human resources and finding great talent to come into our company and knowing and recognizing great talent. And so Curtis is there to help out with that and there's many other uh, individuals in our company that are way smarter than I am. But never always give yourself a lot of credit too. You're also a, a very smart individual. The, uh, and the last thing is, is really you don't need boatloads of money to get started. A lot of people are discouraged. I, I spoke with a, a, one of my store employees one time and he really wanted to get into business. He wanted to have his own restaurant someday and he's just so discouraged because he just didn't have the money to get started. And I, I said, Louis, you, you don't need the money to, to go open your own restaurant. There's a means to get there. You're not going to go out tomorrow and say, all right, I want to open this restaurant and I want to I have it up and running. There's, there's a way to get from point A to point B. Maybe it's working in a kitchen. Maybe it's finding an, a, a restaurateur who is looking for somebody to help eventually take over the restaurant. You, you, if you can get out there and you can network and you can talk to people and you can find the way to get to where you want to go, anything's possible. So you don't need a lot of money. And, and I was very lucky in the beginning to have uh, that $10,000 loan from my grandparents that, that got me started. But uh, I'm sure if I really had to, I could have found another way to do it. And, and Ryan Dyer, my business partner, he used his home computer and some web design software he bought for $80 and started building websites. And he's my partner in, in this business today that um, we're doing, you know, on pace to do several million dollars in revenue here in the next few years. So um, anything's possible and, and you don't need a lot of money. Uh, just watching our time here and uh, leave some time for QA. Uh, a couple things I wanted to leave in the end is, as an employer, um, you see a lot of people apply for jobs in your company. And so anytime I, I talk to individuals that may be applying for jobs or out there, I always like to, to leave with these few things because they drive me nuts when I see them. Um, always proofread your resume. If we see a resume with a typo, a, a grammatical error, anything, we just immediately discard it. There's no point in having somebody work in my organization that's going to be that sloppy and not care. So. Take, take the five minutes to proofread a resume. Um, show up early, and I, I, Curtis laughed at me when I put this in there, bring food, because I can't tell you the number of times when somebody's brought in bagels to a job interview, I immediately like them that much more. <laughs> <laughs> food was amazing, <laughs> it's way to my heart. Uh, apply for the right reasons. Don't apply to a company just to apply there and, and want to get a job. It's it, you're not going to have your heart into it. You're not going to enjoy the job. And ultimately, you're not going to end up being there because your employer is going to see that as well. So apply for the right reasons. Always dress for success. You know, I'm, I'm pretty casual here tonight. We have a casual uh, environment over at Core 3. And you can see that on the website. You can see we're pretty casual. Even if you see that at an organization, still going with a, you know, a suit and tie or uh, whatever, whatever it may be that you're, you're dressing for success because you're going to walk in that much more confident, you're going to seem that much more confident to your employer, and they're going to know that you mean business and you really want to work for this company. Um, offer references early on. I always like, if somebody's really serious, you know, rather than seeing on the resume, references available, I don't want to have to ask somebody for references. If they give them to me, that's that much more of a bonus. Um, and, and this is a, a big one and a funny one. We had somebody come in Applied for a job recently and uh, at, and came in for an interview. I don't know. Can I can I tell this story? Can I yeah, tell parts? Yeah, okay. Curtis is also my HR filter to know if I'm going to get in trouble or not. But uh, when asked, you know, what he thought about the company and, and why I applied there, I said, "Well, my mom looked up the company on on your website, and you guys see, said you guys seem like a great company to work for." So I went, you know, went with that. <laughs> it was something along those lines, yeah. wasn't it? And. Uh, Yes. <laughs> that's not, 
That's not you know if you're if your mom researched a company for you that's that's this great. Is a college graduate, by the way. It's a college graduate. So um, research it it only takes five ten minutes to go through a company's website and and to research them and to know the history of the founders, the history of the company, and it's so much more impressive when somebody comes in with that and said, you know, I'd love to work for you because you guys have been in business for 14 years and you've done this, this, and this. It, it really sets the tone early. And the last thing is follow-up. I can't tell you how many people have come in for interviews. They've been great. They look really good. We say, great, can you get us a list of references or can you email us your resume so we have it digitally? They wait four or five days. It's not like we're a boyfriend or a girlfriend waiting for a call here. There's no set, like, you have to wait a certain amount of days. Get it done. If it's, like, going home and, and getting it done, then, then do that. The sooner, the better. And following up to see, hey, you know, just checking in to see if you guys have made a decision. I'm really excited and eager about the position at the company. That also really goes a long way because it shows that that much more interested. So um, with that, you know, I'm, I'm happy to ask any questions or answer any questions, and I'm always available. You can always email me, and literally my cell phone does not ever shut off unless by accident it runs out of battery. If there's anybody that's looking to start their own business, um, has a business that you want to expand on and wants some thoughts and ideas, I'm always happy to talk about it because I don't want anybody to ever experience the same mistakes that I've experienced, and so I'm always happy to help thwart that off if possible. So, does anybody have any questions? I know Can you I... talk about failure? Oh, what failure. You, what, what did the, the failure do in the search? It's an important ingredient in the entrepreneurial, yeah. uh, in entrepreneurial thinking. And it's tough. It's tough to work through. Um, it's, it's challenging to, to put so much into something and to not see it go forward as the way you intended it to to really put your heart and soul on the line and to, to see it end up in a direction that you really didn't anticipate it would. And, and it's tough to lose money, too. Uh, failure, though, and, and what I've learned is, is not something you can always sit there and reflect on and beat yourself up over. You have to look at the mistakes you've made, look at what you would have done differently, and what you're going to do differently going forward and move on. It doesn't mean that you can walk away from the mistakes you've made and say, oh, well, you know, I blew half a million dollars here. <laughs> oh, wow. Well. Um, it just means that you have to say, all right, I made a big mistake over here. I learned some lessons. Here's what I'm going to do differently. And uh, you know what? I'm not going to make that mistake again. If I did, all right, then I need to beat myself up. But if, if you continue to like sit there and, and reflect on your failures and, and feel bad for yourself and say, woe is me, um, this, I really, I'm in a bad position, you got yourself in that position in the first place. There could have been other things you would have done differently. So learn that and, and move on and move forward from there. Is that? Question? Yeah. Uh, how did you find all your employees for, for different businesses like the popcorn? Uh, business that you started or even for this core three? Early on, we actually used Craigslist a lot. Uh, the, the popcorn store and core three are two different animals, sort of. The popcorn store, we'd have uh, a lot of minimum wage employees that come in and do a couple tasks, and that's, that's all they're doing. And not to take away from, not to say they're any less intelligent than the people at core three, it's uh, the, the talent and specialty areas that you're looking for are a little bit harder to find um, for core three out on Craigslist. So early on we started using Craigslist a lot and now it's it's a lot of networking. It's uh, We get a lot of employees who are coming to us because they see us in print publications and uh, we've won a cool companies to work for award with Cranes. Um, we, what other, Kirk? Well yeah, obviously Lawrence Tech, we, we partnered with Lawrence Tech on the uh, entrepreneurial internship program and um, also partnering with other organizations as well. I know uh, New Horizons Training Center, uh, we found some people through there. Uh, we've never had any success with places like Monster or Dice.com, uh, really, and sorry to those guys, it's just a waste of money. Um, you, they're, they're, I'm trying to think, are there other areas? That? Our, our best employees have really come out of chance. Yeah, luck. <laughs> we, met, we met our sales guy working at um, 
our van. Yeah. Selling furniture at our van. Is a is a brilliant salesman, but and um, now he's selling websites. He was selling copyrights. <laughs> sure. Websites and furniture, same business, just like yeah. popcorn and websites, you know, same thing. Um, so yeah, it, it, it's you know, and it's part of it too is recognizing talent when you're out there. I go to a lot of networking events, so I'm always looking to you know, poach employees or you know find somebody that is uh, extremely talented and say you know hey why don't you come and check out Core Three? And Curtis did that. Curtis was buying furniture, and uh, met. Andy and said, uh, realize his sales abilities and sales talent. We went out to dinner, and next thing you know, Andy's working for us. <laughs> so, yeah. Any other questions? I have a question. Yeah. If you're working a full time job, how many hours should you? Because I know you need so many hours to build a project, but to balance it all, how many hours would you suggest? you know, give to a project this many, plus, you know, because you're multitasking some things, you yeah. can burn out pretty quickly if you, if you overdo it. That, that and, and you know, that happened to me with the, the popcorn stores. It was, uh, you know, by the time I was done, I was just like, all right, I'm, I'm tired. And there was a point in my life where I used to say, well, the answer would have been as many as possible, but you can't be successful with an unbalanced life. You can't be successful with by just working, working, working nonstop and not having family and, and time to relax and time to unwind. Without that time really to go home at night and sit back and, and relax and unwind and gather your thoughts, your, your mind isn't going to be able to be clear and focused and, and re-energized for the next thing. It's just not possible. So, you know, it, it's, it's really as many as you can give with still having that balance in your life. And what you can do is... Um, what I like to do is say, okay, if I want to work on this project and I want to have this other business here at this point out, realistically I can commit X number of hours a night to it, maybe two hours, I can go home, unwind, focus on a little bit. So now I know my planning, I need 100 hours to bring this to fruition to finish my business plan. It's going to take me X amount of time. Um, you know, because like I said, I, I've worked myself to the bone and it just, you end up burning yourself out and uh, you, know, you see, you know, the guy saw it at core three where I was just uh, not bringing my full attention in my A game every day to, to that business. It was kind of a little bit here, a little bit there. Is that helpful? That's helpful. With your, with your popcorn store, your, I'm sorry, I have a curiosity. I need to, how much startup reserve dollars should we baseline and say, you know. It depends. Nowadays, it's really easy to um, be a lot more conservative and start a business. When I launched, when I opened both of the, the two stores that I had, um, the economy, that was when everybody had money that they didn't actually have off of their houses, and the economy was in much better shape. And um, so it was kind of a different time. You, you, when you'd walk into a retail location, they weren't as vanilla, uh, vanilla box as, as they are now. What you're finding now is a lot of retailers are leaving their stores and leaving them in pretty good condition because there's a lot of businesses going out of business. Like my store, for example, uh, my old store in Royal Oak, a cupcake store is coming in there. And they got the hood that I put in there. I mean, I spent close to half a million dollars in build out that they're going to reap the benefits of. And I left it all there. And I actually took over stores. I used to do holiday stores uh, around Christmas time, the, the holidays. And um, I would move in, take over the stores for two, three months. And they were in perfect condition when I'd move in. So it, it really varies. It can be, you know, whatever you want it to be. I mean, you, if you want to open a clothing store, you could find some racks on Craigslist, find a space that's already been used as a clothing store before. You buy a, a cash register and... QuickBooks and, and you're set and you're ready to go. So it's, you know, how you budget it and what you're looking to get into. And I'd be happy to talk to you about it afterwards too. Yeah. And there's somebody back there with a question. I won't forget about that too, but you're right here. Um, <clears throat> I don't know how many employees you have, um, but do you ever, or how do you, I guess, um, motivate or empower them if you do? That's uh, it's an interesting question because we've been through some ups and downs with that. And you know, culture is a very big thing in, in companies and it's what really drives your employees and um, 
allows your company to be successful by having a good culture and, and employees who uh, really believe in you and in your organization. You know, we, we've always been under the mentality that, you know, we've always said this in the past, if you're, you're making the best decision for the company and for the customer, then we know you're making the best decision. But really, and, and giving employees that power to, to work within the organization, really a lot of it comes from the actions of myself, the actions of the rest of the executives in the company, and it starts at the top down. If we're practicing what we preach and, and we're saying, you know, we, here's the new initiatives for this year, here's the revenue goals that we're targeting, and, and here's what you're going to see from us as a leadership team, it, that continues down in the organization. And, and you're going to see that in the culture. People believe in you and the organization and what you're doing. And so you're going you're gonna to have that, that culture of, of people being driven to, to help you and to help the organization and, and feel that. But it really has to start at the, the top and work its way down. That's why when you look at companies like Apple with Steve Jobs as a leader, that's why Wall Street's freaked out that Steve Jobs is, is gone for good because you know, he's really a driver and a motivator at the company and, and he's such a charismatic guy too. Um, and, and so that, that really sets the pace and sets the tone. I think. Question in the back. Yeah. Yeah. What do you What do you like most about being an entrepreneur? entrepreneur and what do you like least about it? <laughs> Every day is a little bit different. Um, what I obviously the flexibility is always very nice, and uh, you 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 like to say you can make your own schedule. That's never the case. There's no such thing as a vacation when you're an entrepreneur. Your mind never takes a vacation. You're always worried. You're always thinking. As you grow your business and you get bigger, you have those around you you can trust and you can actually take vacations. And, and I know I could leave for a week now and the company will still run, I'm not worried about it. In startup phase, uh, you don't get that. Um, I, I like, what I really truly like best about being an entrepreneur is I have the control and the power to do what I want to do with my company and with the company. Um, you know, it, it, and, and that's where it was, it was harder being a, the popcorn franchisee because I wasn't able to say, you know, I think we should, you know, go with these these flavors and, and try these out in this market. So at Core Three, I can say, I really see some opportunity online marketing and social media, search engine marketing. Let's let's tackle that market and let's head that direction. Or we really need to have more residuals in the department. I really feel we should drive that way. Or I want the logo to be red instead of blue. I'd never say that, but um, have the control and I'm able to do that as an entrepreneur. Uh, dislike. It's uh, stressful, you know. He, there are some times where, you know, the, in the past there have been times where I couldn't take a paycheck, or my wife and I, you know, just every week I'm writing a check into that popcorn company to keep it keep it afloat. Feeding it. Oh, yeah, feeding it money. Um, times, you know, where you ride a little tight and you say, all right, I'll I'll wait for a week for for my paycheck. The employees get paid first. And uh, so that's stressful, and, and you're always thinking and always, always worrying sometimes. But if, if, if you get a good, hit good strides with your business and really passionate about it and put, it, uh, put your heart back into it, those types of worries go away. But, um, and there's always you know, little management things that come up. I've, I've had to, and this isn't at core three, you know, I've had to break up fights between two employees and I'm wondering, saying, why, why am I dealing with this? You know, why am I dealing with you guys not getting along and not liking each other? This isn't, this isn't my job. I want to run the company. I want to build and grow and do things. And you know, sometimes you get stuck with those, those types of tasks. So yeah, you deal with them. How much time do you spend looking beyond the operational issues and really looking at, at strategy and executing? How much time do you spend in that area. <laughs> we were just talking about this today. <laughs> Never enough. <laughs> Never enough. Is, Kurt's exactly right, and that was going to be my answer too. It's um, as, as you continue to grow your business, it's important that you realize you have to get away from the day to days. As somebody who started a, started the company, if I see something happening, my natural instinct is going to be, I need to go fix this. I need to go help out. This is my baby. You know, I don't want I don't want my baby to fall and get hurt and 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 crash, you know, I, I want it to be running great. And you have to have the power to say, I've got really smart people running this organization and um, they're going to take care of it. They're going to make it work right. 
step away from those day to day and focus on the vision and, and where you're taking the company. So um, right now, the answer is never enough. But as we continue to grow and evolve, that's that's going to be more and more. And you, yeah, you, you do. Yeah, you, you definitely know what Chris was you saying. Put in your calendar. You have to put in your calendar. And I did that these past two weeks. I, I carved out three hours for vision work and said, I'm going to go to, I haven't said, and, and I didn't do it. I, I figured out where I'm going to go next time. I'm going to go to Somerset Mall. Down in the little area, there's some tables down there. I'm going to hang out and just get some work done. There's minimal distractions there. There's a question. Is it harder to manage twins? Or employees. And how old are They're only four months right now, so I'm and, and get more yeah, identical twin girls. So I'm assuming it's going to be uh, that may tip the scale a little bit, <laughs> but yeah, employees are are sometimes like children too. Yes. Uh, with your uh, uh, companies that, su that succeeded, how long did it turn, take for them to turn profitable? Um. Core three, I'm trying to remember back 14 years now. Uh, you know, when I started core three, I was living at my parents' house. I was working out of my bedroom there. So it really didn't take long because I didn't have much overhead. Um, you know, the <clears throat> so it can be typically what, what most entrepreneurs will tell you and, and is we're launching quote gen right now we're projecting about a year before that business starts to turn profitable. Um, so as you're building a pro forma and looking at your budget, if you're building a business plan, uh, I always like to give myself the worst case scenario. And then, like I said, so it, like I said earlier, if you're going to budget to spend X amount, add 25% to it. If you're going to budget to receive that much in revenue, knock off another 25% and think about the worst case scenario and how long you can survive for doing that. Um, so that's, that's the best answer I can give you right now. Yeah. What would you say is the uh, greatest lesson learned going into you know, going into your own endeavor? Um, well, that's a tough question. The, I like to think the greatest lesson, I don't know, there's, there's always going to be a couple of them. <laughs> Nothing ever goes as planned. Um, you know, not to be too terribly hard on, on yourself. And that you really have to um, really have to care about what you're doing and do it for the right reasons. Not because you want to make a quick buck. Um, it's always nice, and there's always opportunities out there to do it. But if, if you're going after that, then um, it's not going not gonna to work out for you, typically, in the end. Well, I want to thank uh, Paul C. Chambers <laughs> for uh, a great uh, I believe Paul will be here if you want to talk with him uh, individually. I also want to mention to you that the Collegiate Entrepreneurs Organization of Lawrence Tech will hold a meeting next uh, Wednesday uh, in uh, M213. You're welcome to attend. There will be pizza. And if you want to really get into the entrepreneurial mindset, it's great to be around uh, a group of entrepreneurs. The Collegiate Entrepreneurs Organization is a national, is a national organization with about uh, uh, 144 chapters throughout the United States. So you're welcome to be here as, and participate in, in that activity. What time is that? Uh, it's at noon in M213, which is in the management building. And we'd like to, we're trying to build our chapter. We have a very exciting, dynamic chapter. And also uh, wanted to mention to you that we have 918 alums of Lawrence Tech who are what we consider to be uh, the legends or entrepreneurial alumni. We have identified those alumni. We are in the process of continuing to build that database and we are tapping into that alumni uh, using the their talents as mentors and they can work with you as you launch your business or think about your entrepreneurial uh, your entrepreneurial dream. So uh, in addition to that, we have identified through the CEO Club 14 student-owned and operated businesses. <coughs> uh, last month, we presented the first student-owned business distinguished uh, entrepreneurial award for students for the month. This was uh, uh, Taylor Mallow. She has a design business. She's with uh, the College of Architecture and Transportation Design. 
So uh, this month we do have another award that will be presented and we will have a student entrepreneur of the year as well as having an entrepreneurial alumni of the year. And last year it was Donald Stevens who is now building homes in Haiti, very interesting project and he's doing that with lightweight structural steel and has some intellectual property involved in that. So uh, the next of the series will be on February 17th. Uh, one of our alums, civil engineers, Dan McNulty, who is a, uh, a principal in uh, Atwater, uh, and uh, they're a civil engineering firm. They do remediation, a very interesting firm. We hope you will join us next week, and our final speaker, will be Donald Stevens, will be coming back from Haiti to share uh, some of the experiences that he's had uh, in Haiti. So again, thank you so much for being here. I think this was really a, a wonderful experience. Thank you, Paul, for sharing your entrepreneurial journey. Uh, I can just see wonderful opportunities for the company. Uh, believe me, I understand what you went through when you were selling those, uh, those uh, products that you had of the, uh, on the bus. Because uh, our son did the same thing in school. And guess what? His parents got a phone call from the principal. <laughs> So I can certainly uh, relate to uh, that part of the journey, particularly when you are a pure entrepreneur, and you are, and uh, I think that the entrepreneurial spirit in Michigan is alive and well, and we thank you again for being here. So everyone have a good evening and drive carefully. Thank you. Thanks, Harvey. I really appreciate it. Oh, we appreciate you. Yeah, actually, this is one of the best she started to really better. Yeah, it's really good right now. I have a question for you actually. Yeah.